welcome to this edition of History Now, where we're going to be looking at remembering, forgetting and commemoration. Joining me today is Professor Guy Beiner of Ben Gurion University in Israel and Dr. Peter Collins from St Mary's University College, Belfast. So you're very welcome, Guy. I'd just like to ask you about your new book, mm -hmm. Forgetful Remembrance, about the social forgetting of 1798. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why you chose that? For years I've been interested in history and memory and I want to look beyond memory to look at forgetting and I've looked at different research projects in different places in the world about what it means to forget historically but this is a remarkable case I wrote a book a few years ago on remembering 1798 in the west of Ireland and the folklore but it always struck me that it's worth looking at the issue of what happened here in Ulster and what it means when communities who had participated in the rebellion might change their political affiliations. What happens with the Presbyterians who are out in 1798 and later the same communities became, become known as Unionist communities, sometimes strongly associated with Orangism and what that means to memories which are no longer comfortable anymore. And through that I wanted to explore that case. Yeah. And Peter, your book, Who Fears to Speak of 98, it deals with commemorations right up until you know, recent times. What what was the spark that um, set you off on that? Well, first of all, in 1991, which was the uh, bicentenary of the establishment of the United Irishmen, I was involved with the United Irishmen Commemoration Society, and we put on a lot of events that year. Uh, so I continued to be interested in that. And then uh, Cultural Traditions Fellowship came up in 1997, based in the Hall Library. Uh, the aim of that was to organize the uh, bicentenary commemorations of 98 and also to produce a book so that's how I got involved in that. And just back to you Guy, this phenomenon of uh, social forgetting, could you perhaps explain it? Explain it because I will. It sounds yeah. more complicated than it is. I wanted to look what happens when communities have embarrassing events in their past or events which are no longer expedient or politically correct in today's terms and what you do with it. And you would think that what happens, you can just put it aside and forget it. But the story is much more complicated. The more I looked at this case, and I've looked at other cases in other places in the world, so I think it's a wider phenomenon. What happens is social forgetting is not about erasing. It's not about deleting. It's not about wiping out the past. It's something very, very different. It's about disremembering. It's about putting the past aside and at the same time remembering it. So the reason the book is so big is because there's a lot of remembrance going on but it's about the difference between public declarations of something being forgotten, people saying 98 has been forgotten in Ulster, and a lot of private and local recollections still being maintained and passed on from generation to generation. So social forgetting is about this tension between the public and the private, between the outsider and the insider. So it's a special form of remembrance, quite typical, I think, for Northern Ireland, but not only Northern Ireland. We begin finding it all over the world, the communities that have events which are not talked about publicly, and still recalled in more silent forms. There was almost a, like, like you, you touched on it before there, an embarrassment yeah. in, in some cases. Uh, would that be because it wasn't uh, politically expedient to, to remember those things in certain times? We've got to be careful with embarrassment because many people were not embarrassed. Mm. It was part of their tradition, but it wasn't, like you say, part of their politics. I mean, the whole move from people who had been in the late 18th century associated with republicanism of the late 18th century, quite different from later forms of republicanism in some ways, but people who had been involved in a rebellion alongside Catholics against the crown, but later the same communities are unionist communities, loyalist communities, sometimes strong orange bastions. It wouldn't be right in a way to celebrate 98 publicly, and yet the traditions of rebel ancestry were maintained in different ways. So how do you negotiate those tensions? How do you keep it? In some cases, it's the story people would say people just simply forgot about 98, but it's a much more complicated and ambivalent story. Mm. Yeah, and just to lead on to you, Peter, in your book, you've looked at it wasn't just necessarily uh, Protestant communities who for had forgotten about uh, 1798. In your book, you look at Catholic communities who forgot about 1978 mm -hmm. and uh, um, talking about the rise of Daniel O'Connell. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, give us a bit of a background to that? I also touched on what Guy has done, although Guy has done it in greater detail because the book is so much bigger than mine. But anyway, uh, yes, Daniel O'Connell, a very uh, quixotic figure, uh, 
he was actually on both sides in 1798. Apparently, he always claimed that he had been in the lawyers, Dublin lawyers, yeomanry, and therefore was against the United Irishmen. But a Dublin Castle spy pointed out that he had had a foot in both camps. So that that's uh, his kind of conflictedness, which his whole persona and life was was conflicted. You know, he, on the one hand, he was a, an ardent Catholic. On the other hand, his private life wouldn't have stood up to scrutiny. But however, I'll leave that aside. He brought together a kind of Catholic nationalism, which was totally the opposite of the brotherhood of affection of Catholic uh, Protestant and dissenter that the United Irishmen had set up. So he moved the whole uh, nationalist project away from secular nationalism and into the sphere of uh, a kind of a synthesis of Catholicism and nationalism. And to that extent, he also found himself at odds with another group uh, around the, the 1840s, the Young Ireland Movement. People like William Smith O'Brien, John Mitchell, who were Protestant, but also wanted a secular republic along the lines, you could say, as an apostolic succession to the United Irishmen. So O'Connell, of course, was the liberator. He, he got Catholic emancipation. Then he tried to get repeal of the Act of Union, and he held monster meetings. You know, some of these were hundreds of thousands uh, in number. You know, so he he really caught the vibe of nationalism at that particular time. He died in 1847, the year before Young Ireland uh, rose in rebellion because uh, they sort of exhausted all the uh, political ways of uh, advancing their cause. Yeah. So just in, in terms of the ordinary Catholics who would have probably followed O'Connell at the time, what was their sense of forgetting, if that makes sense? Well, there was, again, as in the Presbyterian sense, there was collective and selective amnesia because uh, during the 1830s and 40s, a lot, of, a lot had been uh, dragged up about, uh, for example, Scullabogue Barn and you know, the, the Wexford Bridge that Catholics were associated with, you know, slaughter and, and uh, that they had nothing to do with the essential republicanism of the United Irishmen. So uh, they wanted to sort of distance themselves, therefore, from, from those issues, which I think happened, of course, but uh, most people uh, on the Catholic side hadn't been involved in that. It was just a kind of, uh, it was a jackery, as, as the, a peasant uprising, as some people would say, which didn't really go in for that kind of slaughter. It was a few people were involved in that, uh, but their opponents made much of it. Mm. So they wanted to sort of tread the path of more constitutional nationalism. They didn't want to get involved in uh, any kind of violent struggle. So O'Connell was sort of, uh, had, had kind of captured the uh, zeitgeist of, of uh, the Catholic population at that stage. Following this kind of rise of Catholic nationalism, Catholic nationalism will, will also reclaim 1798 and 1798 in Ulster. They'll identify the heroes of the Ulster Rebellion with the wider cause of Irish nationalism. So the Presbyterian leaders, people like Henry Joy McCracken, will become heroes in the pantheon of, of, of uh, Irish nationalism. And that works in two ways. Often people who might not have a lineage back to 1798 will identify with these heroes, even though they're not from their religious community, but from a political community. It'll also work in terms of forgetting. It'll actually cause an embarrassment for many Presbyterians who do relate to that tradition, but now see it being stolen or co-opted mm -hmm. for Catholic nationalism, which is not their politics. So it works. It can alienate people at yeah. the same time, which is interesting, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And also, Connell alienated uh, Presbyterians by his uh, advocation of uh, uh, Catholic nationalism. For example, uh, he uh, came to Belfast and that created a riot. And of course, the Reverend Henry Cook, who had been uh, born in, and brought up in um, uh, Mahara, had witnessed the burning of his meeting house because his minister had been a a rebel, uh, and he had become a conservative, uh, and he brought together Anglicanism and Presbyterianism in 1834 when he called out the bands of marriage between those two, and it also opened up the doors of the Orange Lodges to Presbyterians, which had pre previously been 
only open to members of the Church of Ireland. So O'Connell created this uh, antipathy towards the whole idea of uh, Republican United Irish Men by his activities in Catholic nationalism. Thanks. If I can go to you, Guy, vernacular history is, a, is a, a massive theme in this book. For people who don't know what vernacular history is, could you give us an example? Sure. Well, it's, it's a heavy term, isn't it? Previously, I've used other terms. In a, in a previous book, when I wrote about um, 1798 in the West of Ireland, I looked at folk history. And I've now moved beyond folk history for the simple reason that folk history is associated primarily with oral traditions. But I think there's something much richer than that. In this book, I try to look not only at oral traditions, but there's a lot of written material. And often you say, this is folklore and this is book lore. But the two are intertwined, especially in a province like Ulster, where there were high rates of literacy, especially among the Presbyterians, but not only among the Presbyterians. And so there's a lot of written material, which is local. It's different from official history. The point of vernacular history, it's a lot of what doesn't make the official historical record. It's not what the academics would necessarily look at. And yet there's a huge amount of history writing in different ways. Then there's oral traditions, which are recorded again and again. But vernacular history goes beyond that. It's also looking at artifacts, for example, at material culture. Huge amount of things that remained from the period and were used as what we call aids de memoir, uh, memory aids to kind of retell story around objects. Or to take another case, visual history, visual sources, um, various paintings and pictures and cartoons later on and caricatures, all this feeds into vernacular history. So in a way, vernacular history is everything that's usually left out of mainstream historiography and yet for historians tells a whole other story which complements our understanding of history. And that for me is where history becomes really exciting. Yeah. Part of that vernacular history would be, you spoke about plays and mm -hmm. um, songs. Is that, would that be a fair thing to say? Definitely. It's often in many different registers and many different genres. Poetry is a mm. key point, for example. From the time of the United Irishmen, there'd be United Irish poets. They themselves, many of them were poets. But also afterwards, there'll be local poetry traditions, like the weavers, the Ulster Scott weavers, who are writing poetry in a dialect, often missed by the authorities, but recalling 1798 at times where you didn't bring it in print. Later on, there'll be other poetic traditions Drama is always a fascinating one. It appears in many different plays and other forms. Fiction, a lot of historical novels. But what's interesting about all of these things in Ulster compared to other places, you could say that 1798, and Peter would know that quite well, appears in fiction and in Irish literature all over the island. But what's unique in Ulster is the sense of embarrassment or even more ambivalence. So people would write plays but not often publish them. Certain poems wouldn't be published or they'd stay within very local publications, wouldn't be well known. Even great writers like um, John Hewitt wrote a play about 1798, the McCrackens, but never published it in his time. Seamus Heaney had a play about Henry Monroe, the leader of the rebels at Ballina Hinch, and yet kept it quiet. And it's this kind of notion of writing plays, and when they do make the stage, they're often kind of passed and moved on. It'll take somebody like Stuart Parker to bring it to wider attention. And, and that's remarkable in itself. So you have all these different genres and all these different forms, but they always show this kind of ambivalence and oblique form of engaging with 98 in memory. I attended in 1998 Stuart Parker's Northern Star in Rosemary Street First Presbyterian Church. Stephen Ray was in it. It was absolutely packed and it got across a message, but even people who would disagree with the message were really, you know, they loved it. So, uh, of course, uh, if you're talking about the vernacular, you can also talk about the autobiography of a working man by Jimmy Hope, you know. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Weaver poets, James Orr of, of Ballycarry and so on, I totally agree with you. I haven't read your book yet because I only just got it, but I'm sure there's a lot in that that will enlighten us. But what's remarkable, we should add to one thing there, that there were always people who were interested in this kind of material. So you'll find antiquarians. That's probably the most interesting crowd. Mm -hmm. Outside of mainstream history, there's always been antiquarians who've collected this material. Mm -hmm. So starting with people who were recognized by historians like Madden, Richard Robert Madden, who collected material, but even later, people like Francis Joseph Bigger would collect all of these traditions and compile them. So there always has been people, 
Except strangely enough, when history became professional, antiquarians were kind of frowned upon and people didn't mm -hmm. look at these sources. Mm -hmm. But there's always been an interest to uncover these sources. Speaking of that, oral history was always frowned upon by the so-called profession. And uh, your book, which I reviewed about the West of Ireland, uh, really inspired quite a few professional historians. And it sort of brought oral history and uh, so on into the historiographical world. So it has moved. That, yeah, to that there, there's to just to lead on the centenary. The centenary is re really significant uh, politically. I know that uh, there were mass protests in, in Dublin, which coincided with the Boer War. But in uh, the north, you had people like John Dillon coming up and, and speaking at the centenary. Yeah, Dillon thing. spoke at a mass meeting in, in Hammerstown, in which he not only uh, spoke of 98, but he spoke of his father who had taken part in 1848. And, you know, it was uh, part of. There were two, actually three marches in, in Belfast at that particular time. Uh, at one stage, they had hoped to get into the centre of town. Actually, this is something that would later happen. You know, we, we had it in the, uh, the most recent troubles where the authorities wouldn't allow people of what they regard as a nationalist bent to come into the centre of town. Although that has changed somewhat. So they weren't allowed to hold any processions in the centre of town and they had to hold it on, in the Falls Road in West Belfast. Um, yes, they, they, it, it was a great sort of revival of nationalism uh, in the North here. Uh, Joe Devlin, who of course was a constitutional politician, used the 98 clubs in Belfast to further his political career. And of course, as you know, he later became an MP for West Belfast. Uh, that brought him into conflict with Alice Milligan and Ethna Carberry and other more advanced nationalists who thought it was a shame that the uh, constitutional nationalists had taken over the memory of a revolution, something that th their forebears had decried. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting, the, the different factions fighting for ownership. But at the same time, you know, what, what you look at, Guy, is the, the, almost the shame of it among people when they're talking about it? Is uh, that it, what that it's not quite shame. No. I, I'd say it differently. First of all, it's about contestations. It's exactly what Peter is saying, and it's how it's translated all the way down to a ground level. Many factions are competing over commemorating 98 and over its ownership. Even among constitutional nationalism, there's the Parnellites and the anti-Parnellites, and they're both fighting over it. The Fenians are trying to get into it. The GAA are trying to take a stake. The Gaelic... Uh, league wants to take a stake. People are fighting from all over. And at the same time, there's this kind of unionist reaction, which is trying to disassociate from it. Um, even people who would have commemorated it otherwise at home, or remembered it, not commemorated, remembered it and memorialized it at home, felt that bringing it out into the street was too much for them. They felt that in some ways their own memory was being stolen from them and objected to it. So it comes a very tense time, specifically in Belfast. And in other places, a few other riots, including Lurgan, by the way, your own place, strong riots. The people who take part in the demonstration in Dublin, when they come back on the trains, the trains are attacked and there's riots that go on for a few weeks. After the march um, in the Falls Road, there's riots for quite a while. Martial law is declared in Belfast. It's a heavily contended area. And this leads into something else which I've dealt with, but it, it's, it's another dynamic. I call it decommemorating. Yeah. As people are commemorating, other people are trying to stamp out commemoration. And that's another... I think characteristic of social forgetting is that social forgetting is about keeping things in the home, keeping things quiet. When they enter into the public domain, it becomes heavily contested and brings out strong reactions. Yeah. There's a, a section in your book where you talked about a partitioned memory. Yep. Can you tell us about that? Because there's a specific uh, thing you say in your book, there's, I can't remember who it was, but they said that the, the rebellion was of no use. All right. You know. Well, well it's, it's the story of Northern Ireland in, in, in many ways. In 1898, 1790, it was brought out into the open. Then there was a huge backlash and it was stamped down. But then there was a bit of a revival. In the early 20th century, there was different cultural activities from different parties, attempts to write plays and poems. Mm. 1798 began crawling back out. Francis Joseph Bigger was about to erect monuments. And then more or less then, 1916 happens, the Great War, partition. And following partition, the whole ethos of Northern Ireland as a unionist ethos didn't have any place for the United Irishman. It works completely against the whole ethos of the state. 
it even is afraid of that kind of ethos because it's being used by the state in the south. So the southern state adopts it as their ethos, which means that you can't allow Catholics to mark it in the north, so it's completely prescribed. And the memory of 1798 goes underground again. And for a long time, the ethos of Northern Ireland was to keep it quiet. And there are moments, by 1948, it's seen no longer as that intimidating and people are allowed to celebrate it, but in a, also with a lot of surveillance, a lot of restrictions. Peter's written quite a bit about that. And it comes out again, but again it's clamped down upon. During the Troubles years, it's clamped down upon again because it's seen as Republican and dangerous. You talked about ballads, then suddenly ballads are banned on radios, so you can't play them. They're seen again as being da dangerous to sing about 1798 in the 1960s. But interestingly enough, there's always people who will bring it out and in a way break the taboo, break the silence. People like John Hewitt, who I mentioned before, mm. or Seamus Heaney, who will bring it out and remind people that there's these traditions out there. So the story of what happens after partition is interesting and always fears that the fact that down south it's being commemorated and therefore in the north it's politically dangerous. Mm. Yeah. The, the 1948, the 150th, you've, as Gaia said, you've written on that. Was it more of a cultural thing? Because were, in your book you talked about there was a, a revival of the Irish language, almost you know, like a mini revival around that time. How did that tie in with this cultural revival? Well, it was cultural, but it was also political. Uh, one of the things that sort of gave a, a, a impetus to commemorating 1940, in 1948 was the release of detainees uh, who had been detained during World War II. Uh, they were welcomed in the, back into the community and seen as heroes. Uh, that's the Catholic community. Uh, but as well as that, it was cultural. There, there was a big revival of Irish dancing there were Feshina, uh, there was organisations like uh, the Common Clue on Art and so on. So the Irish language, the uh, Irish culture was, you know, on and up again. So that fed into what really was a kind of a political uh, commemoration in 1948, in the North that is, because there were socialists, people like Harold Binks, who's one of the leading trade unionists, Victor Halley, oppressed, both were Protestant, uh, but it was mainly um, Catholics, but it was a left-wingish type of uh, commemoration. Uh, there was no faith in fatherland uh, that there had been in 1898 uh, in the north. So uh, they organised a, a lot of events, marched up to the Cave Hill, lit bonfires, you know, read the... Uh, the declaration that was made by the United Irishmen in 1795. Uh, but one of the big things I was mentioning about marches not being allowed into the city centre, mm -hmm. there were bomb sites in High Street and uh, the, the, the committee that was organising the commemoration wanted to hold a vast meeting there. They were forbidden by the Stormont government. Then they decided they wanted to have a, a Cayley. Again, that's ties in with what you were saying about culture. That was uh, banned by the uh, city corporation, which owned the hall, and so they took the, the com committee took it to the courts, won the case, and triumphantly held a Cayley, you know. So loudspeaker vans went all around the national area saying, we've won the case, we're going to have the Cayley after all. So that was, but certainly every commemoration has a decommemoration or an anti-commemoration. And of course, that raised the haggles of the unionist population. So again, it was all tied in with a very bad uh, relationship between North and South. For example, the South had been neutral in the uh, Second World War. In 1948, they declared a republic. There was a, the Chapel Door election, as it was called, for Stormont. You know, so there was a lot of bad feeling between the two communities. So it wasn't exactly a good time to come out openly and commemorate yeah. 1798. So leading on to the bicentennial, just if we can go to you, Guy, all, all of this vernacular history that was existent for all those years, did that come out more in the fore uh, around the, the bicentennial? Well, it's interesting, you see. Around the time when, when Peter was writing his book, it seemed that everything now could be celebrated in the open. It seemed that a whole tradition, uh, a whole history of secret remembrance could come out, of embarrassment had been overcome, because let's remember that the bicentenary co coincides with the Good Friday Agreement. There's this kind of feeling that the conflict is over, 
You have to remember that now because it was a while ago. It kind of, we've forgotten those times. It was a very optimistic time. Mm -hmm. And Presbyterians were commemorating 1798 and many different community events which were remarkable. And it seemed that anything to do with forgetting was over, forgetting it had been overcome. But that's misleading. When you look at it, already then there were seeds to show that other things were at play. Other sides were reclaiming it and it was going to enter into other kind of politics. A big Ulster Scots revival uh, started around that time. So Ulster Scots traditions are coming out and we take it in one direction. Um, other nationalist traditions would come out. And after a while also people would go back and return to keep putting it back behind a veil in a way. Mm -hmm. So the bicentenary was a very optimistic moment, a very open moment, huge celebrations, many local celebrations on a local level. And yet some years later, some of the people who had been involved in those commemorations almost denied it, stepped back. Decommemorating was back in fashion. As uh, Kevin Whelan has said, you know, uh, 98 hasn't uh, g uh, gone into history because it's always present in the po political present. Mm. So yeah, there's, there's a, a, a remark in your book, who, um, I think it was Roy, was it Roy Foster, Roy, yeah. talked about uh, the Disneyfication yeah, oh. of commemoration. Yeah, well, that was all part of the uh, conflict between historians. Uh, you know, Tom Bartlett, who you know very well, pulled him up for saying that. You know, he said, this is a sneering from sort of the ivory tower of, of, of the academia. And, uh, you know, we, we should try to get across history to all uh, social classes and so on, you know, so uh, it, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, you, there are different ways of getting the story of, in this case, 98 across to, to the, po the population, but Roy continued talking about uh, why the Tour de France came to Wexford, you know, but I mean, the Tour de France always starts off in, in uh, like the Tour de, de Yorkshire or whatever, you know, so uh, there was nothing wrong with that. So he and Tom Dunn, who was another historian, who called us, we who uh, took part in the commemoration, commemorationists, you know, as if that was a big put down. Yeah. So, but Disneyfication, uh, museums grew up, some of them didn't last. There were summer schools which didn't have an academic background, it was more of a, a community thing. What's wrong with that, you know? My, my favorite quote from the time of the bicentenary was from a literary critic from the North here, Ed, Edna Longley. And Edna Longley wrote that the best way to commemorate is to build a monument to amnesia and forget where you put it. <laughs> now it sounds funny, but it's more serious mm. than you think. And that's been kind of in a way a motto of when I looked at the material here, there's a lot of forgetting going on while you remember. Yeah. And that's interesting in itself. I think that's a good point to end things on. I'd like to thank my guests here today, Professor Guy Biner, whose new book, Forgetful Remembrance, is from Oxford University Press, and Peter Collins, Dr. Peter Collins, whose book, who fears to speak of 98 is available from Ulster Historical Foundation. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Okay.